One of the most climactic moments in the entire Bible is described by Luke in the book of Acts, the passage that William just read. After an incredible three years of ministry, Jesus is executed on a Roman cross and then miraculously resurrected. He appears to His disciples for 40 days and He instructs them to go to Jerusalem to await the empowering of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit comes to them or upon them with great force and they all begin to speak in languages which were previously unknown to them. This great sign draws a large crowd and sets the stage for Peter's first sermon following the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Peter argues that the miraculous sign that the people have just seen testifies that their witness is indeed true. And their witness was that they had seen Jesus resurrected from the dead with their very eyes. Peter goes on to say that this witness was proof that Jesus was indeed the divine Messiah, just as the scriptures had described. At this point, he delivers a conscience crushing blow by declaring that this very same Jesus, he was the person that the audience, that they had recently put to death. And Luke records in Acts 2.37 the anguished reply of the people when they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? In this question lay the pained response of every person in history whose heart has been laid bare by the bright light of the gospel. It is the question of all questions. What shall I do about my terrible sins? What shall I do now that I have wasted my life? What shall I do to return to God after all of these years? And so Peter answered this question with the simple response originally taught him by Jesus, and now brought to mind by the Holy Spirit so that there would be no mistake, no confusion. He says, and I repeat, repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now in the churches of Christ, we have consistently taught that this and only this is to be the proper response to every sinner who comes to Christ seeking forgiveness. And when quoting or teaching on this verse, we've been especially careful to focus on the idea of baptism because there has been so much neglect and confusion concerning this teaching, this doctrine, this practice. We have maintained that the biblical form of baptism was as follows. It was by water. Paul says in Ephesians 4 verse 5 that there is only one baptism. Many of them existed at the time, but he says as far as Christianity is concerned, there's only one baptism. And in the book of Acts, all those wanting to become Christians are baptized in water as part of the process. We see that in Acts for example, 836, where Philip, the evangelist, and the eunuch, after having taught him, descend into the water in order to be baptized. We have taught consistently that it was by immersion. The word baptized comes from that Greek word baptizo, which means to plunge or to immerse. And we've taught that it was necessary for salvation. In almost every instance that it is used in the New Testament, it is used in connection with salvation. Jesus actually commanded it in Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, and so does Peter when he responds to the people looking for forgiveness. If there was ever a time when Peter could have kind of offered some other kind of answer, 
it was in Acts 2.38, but he doesn't. He simply teaches what Jesus had taught him. So we've taught and we've established these biblical ideas about baptism. I believe we've done it very well. We're known for it. Almost to the exclusion of the other command that is also contained in this passage. Because Peter said, first, repent and be baptized. And we have focused a lot on be baptized but we've not done a lot of work on the repent side. And so I'd like to share some ideas about what this spiritual exercise of repentance requires of us in my lesson this morning. You know, some Christians complain that it's hard to get people to accept baptism. They tell me, well, I studied with that guy, you know, and we had 10 lessons, and, you know, when it came time to be baptized, he, she, whatever, the student, just refused to be baptized. And they'd say, you know, it seems that people have an aversion to water. You know, you explain the way to be baptized and how it's necessary for salvation and so on and so forth, but they balk at it, they, they stall at it. My contention is that people's real problem is not baptism, it's repentance. This is what they're putting off, not being immersed in the water. They're putting off the repentance part. And there are several reasons for this. One, perhaps, is ignorance. People do not realize that sin will cause them to be condemned to hell. Paul says, the wage of sin is death. Romans 6.23. Many times people don't know this because they haven't been taught or in their ignorance they simply do not pay attention to this reality. People will believe in the law of gravity, but somehow they have trouble believing in the law of sin and death, which is just as real and much more powerful. Another reason is perhaps enjoyment. In John 3.19, Jesus says, the light came into the world, but men did not go to the light. Why? Because they loved the darkness. Let's face it, sin is enjoyable. I mean, if sin was not enjoyable, people wouldn't be you know, seduced into it. Sin is enjoyable. And even though people know that there will be consequences, they'd rather play now and take their chances later. A very foolish decision. Another reason is, of course, procrastination. Repentance is unpleasant at first and people naturally want to put it off. And people, of course, put off what they don't like to do. Even Saul, who became Paul the Apostle, Ananias finally you know, preaches to Saul and so on and so on, and finally has to say, what are you waiting for? It means he was stalling, he was holding back. Even the apostle Paul had to be pushed. What are you waiting for? Arise, Ananias says, and be baptized and wash away your sins. Some people think that the time to think about the next life is at the end of this life. And this is so foolish because the end sometimes come much sooner than you think. You might be one step away from the next life and not even realize it. Another reason is skepticism. Matthew eleven twenty one, 21, for example, Jesus is talking to the people and saying, you know, if the miracles that I did in Chorazin were done in other cities, they would have repented a long time ago. Jesus rebuked cities where most of His mighty works were done because they still doubted and they would not repent. You know, if you read through the New Testament, John's preaching, Jesus is preaching, so on and so forth, you see very few examples of Jesus or John the Baptist exhorting people to be baptized. The exhortation always comes for them to repent because that was the problem. If people do not believe, they won't repent. Another reason is pride. Some people are too embarrassed to admit their sins or their failures, or too embarrassed or proud to admit their misunderstanding of religion. 
They've had this one idea about religion for a long time and when confronted with the truth which contradicts what their idea is, they're embarrassed or they're too proud to say, you know what, I believe this other thing and now I've just seen that it's wrong and they can't bring themselves to acknowledge that fact. It takes humility to admit that we've been wrong. We need to change. Another reason people put off repentance, fear. You know, Adam in Genesis chapter 3 verse 10, after he sinned, he was afraid. Sometimes we have a wrong concept of God. We think, well, God is really not fair, or He's angry, or He's pretty harsh. And we're afraid to repent, thinking He won't take us back. And then, of course, the one, well, I was going to say the one that I like. It's not one that I like, but it's one that I see all the time. It's the one that really pinches my heart when I see it. And that's the refusal to repent because of perfectionism. How many times have I heard people say, you know what, I'll become a Christian when I'm better. I'll, I'll obey the gospel, I'll, I'll, I'll repent and be baptized when I, like I'm a better person. And I say, no, 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 you become a Christian because you realize you're not a good person. As Duane was saying, I fail, but God will accept me anyways. This thought makes them feel unworthy and leads them to see Christianity as something beyond them. And eventually they begin to consider Christians as hypocrites. Usually a proper understanding of what repentance is helps dispel some of these false notions and also assists us in experiencing the blessings that accompany this spiritual experience. Repentance is as important as baptism. It is as important as belief. It is as important as confessing Christ because we, each of these, has been commanded by the Lord. It was not a new command, like baptism in the name of Jesus, that was a new command, but it was one that the prophets had been making of the people throughout the Old Testament all the way to John the Baptist. The actual word itself, and I think most of you know this, means to turn. Good example I like to use is you're driving along and you see a street, oh that's my street, you turn down that street and you realize it's a one-way street going the opposite way and you say, oh I'm going the wrong way, I need to turn, I need to repent, I need to turn around and go the other way. That's what repent means. This turning that one does in coming to Christ has several requirements that distinguishes it as true biblical repentance. And so in order to help us remember, I have this little lesson here that's called the five R's of repentance. Or repentance has five R's. The first R, repentance requires recognition. The first R is recognition. In repenting, we must recognize that there is sin in our lives, and sin is the thing that God hates. There is no real turning if we don't correctly identify the things that we are turning from, and that we don't acknowledge that the things we're turning from are evil and unholy in the sight of God. Not just the change of religion. Not just the change of religion but a realization that the things that we have done are wrong in the sight of God. Sin causes condemnation and condemnation brings death. And so repentance requires a repudiation of sin as the cause of our separation from God and damnation. That's what Romans 6, 23 was about. Repentance says it's sin's fault that I'm going to hell and I will now reject sin. Number two, repentance requires responsibility. Repentance requires responsibility. Repentance is the moment when we acknowledge that we are responsible for sin, we are accountable for what we do. You know, there may be extenuating circumstances in our lives, maybe we had a bad childhood, 
Maybe there was social pressure, maybe we were abused. But in the end, we are the ones who actually commit the sins. The psalmist says, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. God cannot forgive our sins if we blame them on someone else or something else. Thirdly, repentance requires regret. Regret for sin is the sign that we truly understand and now feel the damage it has produced in our lives, in the lives of others, and especially the life that we have with God. The great regret that I have is that I heard the gospel only as a fully mature adult male. That all those years before, all those formative years, I'd never heard the gospel. It was nearly, I was nearly 30 before someone sat me down and showed me the gospel. I regret that. I regret all those wasted years. The prodigal son was moved to go home when the effects of his sins became apparent and he had regretted what he did against himself. I mean, he was starving to death against his father, whom he had dishonored, against his God that he had disobeyed. If we don't feel the pain of our mistakes, we rarely are moved to do anything about them. Number four, repentance requires reformation. Reformation. Jesus tells the parable of the two sons who were asked to work in the vineyard by their father. Matthew 21, verse 28, you know the story. The first son, the first son said, oh, I'll go. Yes, father, I'll go do the work. But he doesn't do it. He changes his mind. He doesn't do it. And the second son refuses to obey his father, but then he repents afterward and he went to work in the vineyard. Among other things, Jesus is showing here that true repentance in one's heart is seen in a change of behavior. Repentance requires a change in one's attitude, one's attitude toward God, from disobedient to obedient, toward others, from selfishness to love, toward self, from pride to humility. You can fake baptism, but you cannot fake repentance. The change is there for all to see, especially God. And finally, repentance requires restitution. Now the gospel teaches that everything that I owe to God for my sins has been paid by Jesus on the cross. Colossians chapter 2 verse 14. However, my sins have also hurt people. And true repentance demands that as far as I am able, I should try to make right the things that I have done towards others. Not to save my soul, but rather to give a witness of my faith to others and for justice's sake. That's why Christians who are perhaps in jail need to serve out their sentences and behave themselves. That's why rude behavior needs to be apologized for. That's why Christians who are divorced should make their alimony payments and cooperate with their former spouses and family matters and so on and so forth. Our sins have caused suffering in others and although we cannot always repair the past, we can show that we are sorry and do our best to comfort those that we have damaged with our sins. God provides grace to forgive our sins. We can provide kindness and restitution to help others forgive us as well. Unlike baptism, which is a one-time event, and if you were in my lesson this morning, one-time event if it's done biblically, and for this reason we need to practice the spiritual discipline of repentance. 
And what I was wanting to say is that a, a baptism is a one-time event, but repentance is an ongoing spiritual exercise. This lesson was not just to encourage non-Christians to understand what they must do as they contemplate baptism, but also to train Christians in how to grow in their ability to repent. You might not understand this, or you might think this is strange, but repentance brings great blessings. If you're a Christian and God is working with you, and God through His Spirit points out in your heart something that needs to go, you know it, you've been dragging this sin along for a long time, and finally the Lord decides to work with you to point it out, He's offering you the opportunity to experience a tremendous blessing because on the other side of that repentance is joy and peace and understanding and insight. I know it's hard sometimes to think that way, but trust me, trust God, trust the word. When we're brought to the point of repentance, especially as Christians, it's a signal that God is ready to develop us further spiritually. For the person who isn't a Christian, it's the point where you're one step away from eternal life. And so I mentioned the five R's that create repentance. Recognition, responsibility, regret, reformation, restitution. When these are put together to form repentance, there are two additional R's that come forward. The first is restoration. When there is repentance, a sinner is ready to be buried with Christ in baptism, or a Christian is ready to ask for forgiveness in doing so, that person is restored to a right relationship with God. And those of you who are Christians here, most of you are, know what great peace and what great comfort it is to know that you are in a right relationship with God. And the other R is for rejoicing. There is no rejoicing on earth or in heaven without forgiveness. There is no forgiveness without repentance. And so this morning, if your heart is asking, what must I do to be saved? If your heart is asking, what should I do to be restored? I would encourage you to repent as the first step and then make a decision for what the next step needs to be in your life. And I would encourage all of you tonight, I, this is a kind of a two-part thing, tonight, tonight's sermon will be Miracle in the Water. And I would encourage you to come back to hear the second part of this lesson. If repentance is what you need to be doing this morning, then we encourage you to come forward now and make that repentance known as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.